Okay, so I've talked about the Reformation in a general sort of way. I want to talk about it now more in connection with the Bible because the Bible was the, the basic text for the Reformation. Now, if we go back into the 13th century, we had a man called Archbishop Peckham. Uh, the Archbishop is uh, okay, one, one of the top elite members of the church. And Peckham had... Sorry. He had tried to make sure that everybody had a basic idea about what actually is in the Bible. Because, remember, we said that the church was moving away from the Bible, and uh, we got lots of kind of monogatari growing up uh, in the Catholic Church that are not in the Bible. And so, this guy, he's worried. <sighs> Even the priests don't really know the Bible these days. We want, we want them to know the basics, all right? Uh, maybe not everything, but they should at least know these things. So he, he made a sort of minimum. They should know the Ten Commandments. They should know the, the Creed. There were certain basic parts of the Bible that he thought that everybody should know. And so uh, they started pushing Bible knowledge in the 13th century. And that was, at least they should know this. And then, later on, a man called Wycliffe in the 14th century translated the Bible, the whole Bible, into English. This was the first time the Bible had been translated into English. And when the Bible was translated into English at that time, remember we, we talked about lots of kind of um, problems in the society like um, war and hunger and disease. And when people started to read the Bible, in that particular situation, they started to feel angry against the church. They started to feel angry against the king. They started to feel they're using religion to control us. So the translation of the Bible actually had a powerful social effect to make people fight against the uh, the king at the time, and against uh, some parts of the church. So we have this man, Watt Tyler, very famously leading quite a large group of people from the lower class, the peasant class, very low class people, um, leading them to fight against the controlling elite. And so translation of the Bible became connected with social violence and attacks against the elite. So, in the early 15th century, a man came along and said, look, Peckham said at least they should know this. Okay? Put it up here like that. Okay? Okay? Uh, at least know this. Uh, and if you know more, that's good. But uh, Arundel went anti-homing. He said, they should only know that central basic information. They shouldn't know anything else. Okay, that's kinship. All right, that's secret for us. So uh, only those central teachings uh, should be spread among the people. Most of the Bible is a closed book but it's kingshi for ordinary people. But slowly, as we move towards the beginning of the 16th century, people start thinking maid. Right? It's okay, isn't it? I can, I can put a little story from the Bible here in my book. I can put a little bit of the Bible here. And, and scotches and scotches and little bits of the Bible were coming into publications uh, so that more and more of the Bible was kind of becoming openly readable by ordinary people. People could access the Bible much more. And also, uh, we think that, you know, 
I think of it, you listen to me, and I say, I can't tell you, but because they heard Latin in the church, you know, from the time they were children, probably even ordinary people understood some Latin. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Pater Noster would mean our father. Every English person must have known that in those days. Okay. Um, they must have known some, a fair amount of basic Latin because they heard it in the church. And those people who understood it would explain to those people who didn't understand it. So Latin and the Bible were spreading among the people anyway. When you can't and so maybe in that situation, we don't need a reformation. The Bible gets spread around more and more in English. People understand a fair amount of Latin. We can get the Bible. We can get information about the Bible, especially now, of course, uh, as we get to the beginning of the 16th century, we have the printing press. Books are being published and people can access books. You know, before that, before that, a typical book cost the same or more than a house because it was written by hand. They didn't use paper, they used animal skin for each page. It would take a year, maybe, sometimes more, just to write by hand a you know, beautiful, beautiful looking book. The price of that book would be more than most people's houses. It cost a huge amount of money. Only the rich could have books. But now books are published. Books can be, go to the bookshop, buy, buy the book. It's printed on easy paper. There are many copies available. It's, it's, it's easy. Everybody can read. So with this printing press and the spread of uh, Bible material in English, we don't really need a, a reformation, okay? If things carried on like this, uh, more and more people could understand the Bible, and perhaps uh, we didn't really need to have a reformation. We could just smoothly continue uh, and spread the Bible ideas, and things would go very easily. And there would be kind of slow reforms, but uh, there wouldn't be this sudden big change of a reformation. And certainly, uh, that's what Henry imagined. That's the way he saw things. Okay? What reformation? I don't see a reformation. I don't see any need for a reformation. Why, why do we need this thing? Okay? So... As we said before, Henry disagreed violently with it, and he uh, exchanged bitter letters with Luther, the leader of the reformers in Germany. And then he broke away when his marriage uh, uh, was not allowed to be ended by the Pope. And right up to the end of his life, he never really agreed with the reformers. So you've got a Catholic church that isn't Catholic. It's kind of in some way Protestant, but basically it's a Catholic church. Okay, most of this we've talked about before. We don't really need to spend much time on this, I think. People are, people are filling in the bits on the print, so I'll just leave it for a little minute for you to, to do that if you want to. Okay. Okay. And so... The two basic reforms that Henry accepted were, who remembers? What were the two basic reforms that Henry did accept? He had to do something for the Protestants when he uh, changed the church and started the Inculcate Church, the Church of England. Does anybody remember the two things that he, the two reforms that he introduced? He closed the monasteries, all right? Shodori, okay? He closed them all down. And the other one was? Anybody? 
<laughs> okay, yeah, I think this is why it's a good idea to teach in this kind of way and come back to things so you can constantly remember the really important points. The other important point was that he allowed the translation of the Bible. Okay, so those two things. So he closed the convents and monasteries which were corrupt and unpopular. All right, there's this kind of image of the, the monk in those days, a greedy, selfish person who ate lots of food and was big and fat and didn't, didn't really exist to help other people. There was that kind of image. All right, uh, and I said last week, that's not always true. I mean, in fact, the monasteries did important work, but there was this kind of feeling, too many of them are fat and selfish, and they're living off our work. They're living off our money. They don't work for society. So there was this kind of feeling. Um, and when he, when he did this, he was very happy because he got, he took everything for himself. He took the land, he took the, the, the money, he took everything that the monasteries had, and it became his. And he could use that to buy friends. All right. If you if you support me, I'll give you this money. If you support me, I'll give you this land. So he was able to use the the uh, property of the monasteries to make himself more powerful. But like I said last week, if you remember, the monasteries also did important social work. So some of the monasteries were bad monasteries. But other monasteries were, were doing positive things. It's, it's always a difficult situation here. Um, hospitals didn't exist independently. People would go to the monastery. Schools didn't exist independently. People would go to the monastery. Poor people get help from the monastery. So the church, to that extent, was a kind of social safety net for people in trouble. If they were sick, if they needed education, if they were poor, there was a kind of safety net there. And when the monasteries were closed, England lost that safety net. You may, again, looking forward to our more recent time, you may know Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist, in the uh, 19th century, very famous novel showing children with no education, children with no rights, poor children dying in the streets because nobody would help them. So really, in the 19th century, England was still having social problems as a result of closing the monasteries. And then later, the government starts to take responsibility more, and uh, we get a, a network, a sort of safety net that we have today to help people uh, when they fall uh, low into a lower position in society. And also, to give education. When, when Charles Dickens wrote Oliver Twist, there was no Gimu Kyoiku. But 50 years later, England had Gimu Kyoiku, uh, compulsory education. So those kinds of things, uh, which, the again, the medieval period, the Chuseiji Dai with its monasteries, with its Catholic thinking, was developing quite nicely, developing quite well. And then suddenly, bam, along comes Henry and knocks it out. And it takes England quite a long time to, to get back to uh, having a, a working social system that doesn't leave lots of poor people dying on the streets. So, uh, unfortunately, we're having social problems again now, and poor people are again in difficulty and living on the streets in, in Britain now in quite large numbers. So... These things seem to go in cycles. We 
okay, the, the, um, the number of beggars went up because the church was no longer able to give them support. They couldn't go to the monasteries to get a meal or to get looked after in any way. And as I say, the monastery's role in poor relief was not fully compensated for until the 19th century. And we've seen these pictures of the ruined monasteries and abbeys um, before. And then the other reform was the translation of the Bible. The, the idea of having the Bible in a language that everybody really could understand, a complete Bible, nothing cut out, nothing changed. This was a very strong idea of the reformers. So that was a kind of kingly of the people. So that they couldn't be tricked by the church. I talked about St. Jerome a little bit last week, and they said that uh, many of the things that he had translated were, were wrong. There were some serious mistakes. Can you remember any of those serious mistakes? I think I talked especially about one big mistake that the reformers said Jerome had made in his translation of the Bible. Do you remember what it was? Penitence and repentance. What to do when you've been a naughty boy or a naughty girl? Do you, do you punish your body physically by not eating and, and by kind of beating yourself up or making yourself uncomfortable in some way? That's penitence. And repentance is feeling sorry in your heart. And the reformers said Jerome made a big mistake. He, he gave the wrong translation. For the reformers, you have to feel sorry in your heart. And so that was what an example of the things that uh, they said Jerome had got wrong. So a man called William Tyndale started translating the Bible. In, uh, he started with the New Testament and Henry punished him. Henry put him to death just before Henry himself left the church. Tyndale is very, very important, not just for translating the Bible, but for the English that he chose when he translated it. At this time, the English language is kind of, you know, it's not fixed, it's not set. There are, we don't know, we've still got different ways of speaking English, but there was no kind of standard fixed English in the way that we have today. Tyndall gave the English language a kind of identity in terms of the vocabulary that he used. Which words did he choose? Did he choose a Latin word or did he choose a, a, a German word? He chose quite a lot of German-based words, giving English a more Germanic identity. And uh, we, we sometimes say, uh, without Tyndale, we couldn't have had Shakespeare. Shakespeare's English comes from Tyndale. Tyndale developed the English language uh, as well as translating the Bible. But he, he was punished. He was put to death. Uh, he left England. He worked on his translation. Uh, then finally, finally, uh, when Henry became um, separated from the Catholic Church, his advisors, his Protestant advisors, said, look, let's, let's allow the translation of the Bible. And a man called Miles Coverdale was the, um, the person. Tyndale Moore, he was dead. Um, but Tyndale's Bible was used by Coverdale to, to make uh, a translation of the Bible. And now, this translation, it was Gimu, every church had to have a copy of the Bible. Okay? Um, the, so, for, it, it, quite quickly, 
禁止からあの義務になりました。Okay, it was forbidden and then it became、uh, obligatory. You have to have the Bible in the church. And everybody has to be able to read it. It was a, it was a great big book held by a chain. Too big for somebody to pick it up and walk out. Okay? But everybody is able to go there and open it and read it. So it's now making the Bible public and open to everybody. And here's the king.、Uh, so it's not a very good picture, but he's, uh, he's uh, officially spreading the Bible, giving the Bible out to the people. So, Cranmer commissioned Coverdale to translate the Bible. And we've got,、uh, it's, it was called the Great Bible because it was a very, very big book. And、uh, here he is giving out the book to the people. So, I want to connect now with the idea of what the Bible was teaching. We talked about penitence and repentance. Uh, I talked a little bit more also about、uh, pardons and indulgences. So I want to make this one uh, again, uh, give you a clear explanation about this. The church sold these documents, these pardons, these indulgences to ordinary people, and people believed that if they had that, they'd go to heaven more quickly after they died. So the Bible. As we said, teaches heaven and hell, but the Catholic Church taught purgatory. And most people would think, I'm not perfect. I won't go, to I won't go straight to heaven.、But、most people would think, well, I'm not really i j i w a r u so I won't go straight to hell. I'll go to purgatory. And most people supposed that they would go to purgatory. So the church said, okay, everybody thinks they're going to go to purgatory. How long will they go for? We'll sell them pieces of paper to tell them that this is 100 years less in purgatory. This is less time in purgatory. You can go to heaven more quickly with these pieces of paper. So that's the story that the church sold to the people that if you buy these pieces of paper, you'll spend less time in purgatory. And holy relics, like pe people would go around saying, This, is, this wood is from the cross where Jesus Christ、uh, died. It's very, very precious. It's very, very expensive, very, very rare. But if you have it,、uh, you will be protected. Okay, so they were selling、um, Mochirobu. <laughs> we saw this stuff. But they would pretend that that wood came from the cross that Jesus died on. Or they would pretend that, that this was some special Shukyo no Kanke no. Um, and, and again, they would get money from people who believed these stories. So they believed that、uh, there were special powers if they, if they owned those kinds of treasures. And here we've got a, a, an example. Here's the pardoner. He's got piles of money here. He's, he's writing out the bits of paper and signing them. And people are coming up, queuing up to get their pardons. Even in Ju Yong Seiki, a、uh, very famous、uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. We've heard of the Canterbury Tales. Written by Chaucer.、Uh, one of the characters in the Canterbury Tales is、uh, a pardoner. Canterbury Tales, 14th century. And there's a pardoner in, in the Canterbury Tales. One, one of these people selling these things. And he is a real, you know. <laughs> he knows that he's cheating people. Okay, even in the 14th century, Chaucer knows that this is just a lie. Okay, so it's for a long time 
uh, many English people, intelligent people, would say this is just the church making money. This is this is they're getting rich for themselves. So uh, finally, then in the 16th century, people stand up and say more, more tax time. Okay, stop it. And so that's another big difference between the Bible and the Catholic Church. This is just something There's nothing in the Bible about that. So one of the things that changed very quickly in the Reformation was no more pardoners, no more pieces of paper like this. We talked about penance and, and repentance. So again, I'll go fairly quickly through this. Uh, the sorts of things they would do, they would kneel for hours on a cold floor. They'd, uh, they wouldn't have give themselves food. They'd punish their bodies. And in this way, they would be able to go to heaven. And the reformers said, no, that's a mistake in Jerome's Bible. Uh, the, the actual Latin was penitentiam agera, to do penance. So penance was something you do. You go down on your knees. You say, okay, you, you do it. But the Protestants said that's a mistranslation from the original. It should be something you feel, not something you do. So it's a physical act, but uh, repentance is a mental, a mental state. Okay, we talked about this before, so I don't want to talk too much about that now. These are examples of uh, penitents in the, this one is from the uh, 15th century. Uh, they would use these kinds of whips to punish their body, all right. And even until quite recently, this kind of thing was happening in the Catholic Church. Okay? I think maybe about. He was a Catholic. When he was a schoolboy, they, 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 were, they, were, they were still doing these kinds of things. Okay, so I'm 65. So, 50. I think it's changed now. I don't think the, the Catholic Church uh, in general encourages people to do these kinds of things, but it was part of the Catholic Church until um, even inside my lifetime. Okay? So there's something really important here because the reformers felt that religion should be to do with your heart and what you truly believe not just a process that you act out, not just something you do. And I think also you could say, you know, it's very difficult to say wari wari because because we are quite different inside ourselves. It's not like Japan where you can say wari wari nihonji more easily. There's a kind of national identity in Japan that's stronger. But I think one of the things about English people is that daikai, they don't feel very comfortable with strong physical things. Okay, if somebody dies, they put on a majime nakao, on zangnen, you know, no dokuni and everything, but they don't have, oh, 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 you know, they tear their clothes and start, you know, beating themselves up over it. That's Southern Europe. That's a kind of Spanish, Italian, Latin kind of behavior. For the Germanic English, it's <laughs> we, we, we don't really do that sort of thing. And I think the English felt uncomfortable, and the Northern Europeans in general felt uncomfortable with the acting out of the Catholic Church. With too much ceremony, too much... Even today, if you go to Spain at Easter time, they're carrying Jesus through the streets, and, and people, the, the, the huinki of a Spanish Easter is really, it's very powerful, it's very emotional, it's very acting out, it's very physical. And I think that the Northern European people never felt very comfortable with that. So the Reformation in the north of Europe is about, we don't want all those ceremonies. 
We just want to feel God in our hearts. All those outward ceremonies are not really our national character. We're not like that. So I think there's that, that kind of thing going on as well. So, I talked also about predestination. I talked about justification. These are really complicated ideas, aren't they? You remember them a little bit? Do you know the word destiny? We have two words in English uh, for umme. If it's a uh, Uh, <laughs> we've got um, destiny, which is usually a, usually positive, and fate, which is often uh, negative. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but these two words basically mean umme. Now, pre means before. We also have in English the word destination. Okay, uh, the mokuteki of where you're going. Okay, my destiny. I get on the train in the morning. My my destination is Yotsuya Eki. That's where I'm going. My destination uh, is connected with my. In a bigger way, is connected with my umme to go to Yotsuya Station with the Chik Chik people. Thursday morning, but. Uh, the predestination is my kara kimete ita umme. Okay, it was decided before. And this is something that the, the Protestants, read in their way of reading the Bible, they understood the idea God decided, Sashotara, God decided from the beginning that we are going to go to heaven and. Uh, if you think about it logically, that means God also chose some people to go to hell. So some, some Protestants believed that you would also kimete ita. You got to go to heaven or hell. So this is the idea of predestination and. The contrasting idea is free will. We talked about it before. And uh, so you've either got predestination or you've got free will on this side. And the other thing was justification. Just means hadashi. Do you know this? Just, justice, for example. Just. Justice. Okay? Justify means how you justify something. We call it dojde tadashi in Shota. Justify what you say. Support what you say with proof. To justify. Okay? So justification, I, I gave you the idea last week. Kami shinu toki tengoko ikuto. Okay, God, would you let me in? And God would say, why? Why should I? How do you, how do you justify coming to heaven? Why should I open the door to you? All right? And so uh, the Catholics would say, I did good things. And the Protestants would say, um, I, I believe in God. Okay? Anata wo shinjiru kara tengoku ni irete. And uh, the Catholics would say, "I koto yarimashita no de." Again, there's a difference between kokoro no kanji, what I feel in my heart. I trust God. I believe God, and I, what I act out, what I do by my movements. Okay, uh, it's one of the big differences between Catholics and Protestants. Okay, so again, seisho no kotoba wo tsukatte Protestanto wa yappari ano. Predestination, umeo asaisho kara kimeteru, to 
I justify, I'm justified by my faith. Okay? And they disagreed with the idea that you know, what you do will make a big difference. Uh, I said this uh, it was like this in the 16th century, but now if you look at Catholics and Protestants, most people, most Catholics would say, uh, you know, most Protestants would also say, also say, okay? Because people who believe in God will do, do, will do good things. People who do good things do them because they believe in God, something like that. But analogy died, uh, these two things were, were quite separate. So, God is sitting up here and he's going to, he's going to choose some people to go up to heaven and other people are going to go to hell. And this is what our human life is. All right. We are, we are, our period, the Tudors and the Stuarts, people are just beginning to think that maybe there's not, life is not only this. But still, this is, this is the basic idea of life. This is really the Tuesday idea of life. You live to choose up or down, or you live, you know, this is, this is kind of, you know, before your real life. Your real life is after you die. You go up or you go down. So, yeah, justification coming from just and justify, it means what you need to go to heaven. And the Bible, for the Protestant reformers, the Bible is saying you need to believe, you need to have trust. And the Catholics are saying that it's your actions on this earth that make the difference. So to go to heaven, you have to have faith. And again, the Bible says, okay, in Romans, see, this is one of, one of the bits of the Bible. Okay, there are many parts of the Bible that have different comments about this, but we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. If you love God, okay, in your heart, okay, things will be good for you. To them who are the called, okay, they are called, they are your body theory, they are uh, erande, era, erabe, erabe, they're chosen uh, according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, for is before, my karashiteta, okay, he did foreknow according uh, uh, he, he also did predestinate, okay? Predestination, predestinate, koko uh, to be uh, conformed to the image of his son, uh, so that um, the, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, them he has glorified. So Mary, those are the ones who are going to go to heaven. So, uh, the Protestants gave great importance to these kinds of words from the Bible, saying the important thing is not what you do. There are many good people, according to Protestants, there are many people who do good things in this world who will go to hell. Because they don't believe. You have to believe. That's the Protestant view, based on uh, what the Bible is telling them. Okay? <laughs> Wake up because... It, you're probably feeling tired now after all of that. Uh, and uh, I think maybe that's a good point for us to actually finish the Okay? There's a lot of information there and a lot of stuff on your prints. I will put the, um, the last part up for you so that you can finish the prints if you, you know, have the time. Okay? But I think that's probably enough for us today. Yeah? All right. Okay. Um, so remember what I said, that we will have a test in, in November, and I'll collect your prints. Um, keep on checking the page, and please, please, let's see something put on the blog or an email asking me a question about something, all right? And that way we can, um, you know, I can teach you exactly what you want to know, all right? Okay, then, thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.
Okay, we didn't get to finish this in class, so here's the extra part. This idea that to get to heaven, one has to believe that one's been chosen to go to heaven by God from the very beginning came to be called justification by faith. We talked about this before, so you should have a reasonable understanding, or I hope you do. And so by having faith, by trusting that you've been chosen to go by God, you're justified, you're qualified, you can go to heaven. And the Catholics, on the other hand, believe that it was your actions or your works on this earth that justified your entry to heaven. And that came to be called justification by works. Now these days, most Catholics and Protestants would agree that you need both or that it's likely that both are going to happen. A, a person who has strong faith will normally do good work. So most Catholics and Protestants would say, well, yes, it might be more important for a Protestant to have faith and more important for a Catholic to do good works. But I think both churches would accept that both are usual in uh, their image of the kind of person who's going to get into heaven. So in those days, though, it was much more polarised. Again, we've talked about this. This is all revision, really. And the idea of whether it was faith or works that let you go to heaven was one of the big differences in those days between Catholics and Protestants. The Protestant reformers believed that by making the Bible available in the vernacular, people would be able to see and understand the truth of the Bible for themselves. Now, this is actually probably a, a big mistake in their thinking. The effects of translating the Bible do mean that everybody can read it, but it doesn't mean that everybody's going to understand it in the same way. And so the reality was rather different, very different, in fact, from what they expected. Jacques Derrida and others have pointed out in the philosophy of language over the recent period of time that language is a very slippery thing, and even the most basic things can mean something different to different people. When Jesus Christ is asked, what is the basic teaching of Christianity? He says, the first of all the commandments is, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, meaning is similar. Namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Well, it's fairly short. Surely we can agree on what it means. Can we, though? Actually, it can be understood in different ways. When Christ says the Lord our God is one God, does he mean that the only true God is the Christian God? That there's only one God and it's our God? Or does he mean that one person's idea of God and another person's idea of God are equally true? It's all one God. It's all one Lord, whether you're a, a Christian or some other religion. That God is one from whatever religion you approach God. And love thy neighbour as thyself is also problematic. Firstly, of course, there are lots of people who don't love themselves or even hate themselves. So how should they behave towards their neighbours? And then, of course, people have different ideas of what love means. For some, it means always being kind. And other people would say, no, no, con constant kindness just leads to making people spoiled and indulged. You have to be strict sometimes. So what what is meant by love? And of course, you have to ask yourself, what is a neighbour? Is it the person next door? Does it mean you have to love the person next door, but not the person on the opposite side of the street? Does it mean you have to love everybody in your street? Are they all neighbours? Or the whole village or town or country? Could, could you think, in some sense, now that we have the internet, the whole world is our neighbour? Should we be thinking that everybody is our neighbour? So for some people, neighbour would mean the people close to them. Others would understand it as meaning, no, humanity in general. Everybody is my neighbour. OK, so these things have a different kind of meaning and people will interpret the Bible in different ways. Now, the result of that is that translating the Bible didn't work out the way the Protestant reformers expected. It didn't just give people the truth. It just opened up a lot of topics for debate. And 
I'm one of those people who thinks that probably that's what the Bible is anyway. Like all literature, it's not there to teach the truth. It's there to encourage people to think about what might be true or what might be best. It's there as a starting point for debate so that we can ask ourselves, you know, why we are here in this world and what our moral duties are to ourselves and to each other and so on. It's not an answer in itself. It's encouraging people to ask questions. But that's not the way that most people have been looking at religion over the centuries. So, in that sense, translating the Bible into the vernacular had a huge effect on society. Religion wasn't just a matter of going to church and listening to the priest who was reciting the Mass and uh, going through the formula, but it was a matter of public debate. It spilled over into literature and people's lives in all kinds of ways, and it had a huge effect in changing the kind of society that we, that we live in in this world.